We start with Elizabeth Bick. Um, she's one of, she used to be a microbiologist, um, but right now she's a scientific integrity consultant, as far as I know, but I think she can tell it much better herself. So I'll just give the mic to her, if uh, that's fine with you. Yeah, uh, I, I'm the host, so I'll, I'll, I'll transfer the mic. So, uh, but thank you so much uh, to uh, announcing uh, Elizabeth. I'll, I'll do it as well, so then she will have bo two announcements. So uh, thank you for now, uh, Krijn and Anne, and uh, I hope you will enjoy this conference. Yes. So Elizabeth, you're you're already here almost 10 years ago, um, I guess. Uh, you were a scientist at Stanford University and um, uh, you read articles just randomly about scientific integrity and uh, plagiarism. And out of curiosity, you Googled some quotes of your own papers and quickly found that other authors had lifted text without giving credit to you. So you say in an article in, in Nature, I was hooked, I was angry. I don't know if you pronounced it that way to the interviewer, but I can imagine you did. So the journalist who wrote, it, who wrote this Nature article called you a super spotter of duplicated images in science paper. And as uh, Krein already said, you call yourself a full-time scientific integrity consultant. So, welcome Elizabeth Bick. <laughs> and I hope your microphone works properly. So, I'll put mine down. I hope it's not going to sing. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, good morning everyone. Big thank you for the organizers for inviting me. So I'm a microbiologist um, with a Dutch background. I did my PhD at Utrecht University. And uh, I moved about 20 years ago to the United States and worked on the human microbiome, so the, the bacteria that live inside our bodies. But as I was working on Stanford, like we just heard, I got interested in science integrity, first started in plagiarism, and then started to realize I have a sense of, uh, of, of picking up patterns and duplications in images. So that sort of became my hobby. And then I quit my job at some point when I thought that it was much more interesting to work on that and I could do much more for science than working uh, at a company or in a, in a, a university. And so um, I'm running the blog Science Integrity Digest. I have to admit I'm not a very frequent poster there. I'm actually very active on Twitter, so you can follow me at Microbiome Digest. That's sort of a remnant of my previous work interest, I guess. And it's missing the E because Twitter only has so many characters. So have to I had to drop um, a letter. Um, before I start, I do want to get rid of all my disclosures. Of course, I, I might criticize other people for not disclosing their conflict of interest, so I have to do that really properly. So yeah, I get consulting fees and I get um, for, for doing consulting work for publishers, lawyers, um, universities, uh, all kinds of things. I also get sometimes speakers honoraria. So that's uh, my, uh, some, some of my sources of income. I am an author on four patents. Uh, I worked at a company called Ubiome. Um, they got raided by the FBI. And the founders are now being charged with insurance fraud. So that was quite a ride. Um, I had actually already left the company when that happened, but the FBI really knocked in the door in, uh, in San Francisco in the office, took all the computers. And, uh, but the, the founders have been found guilty. I have not, I've never been interviewed by the FBI, so I assume I uh, wasn't considered to be a suspect in that. And apparently the, the founders have fled to Germany, so if you ever see them, please let the FBI know. <laughs> They're now fugitives, it's just a wild ride. So it's sort of like Theranos 2.0, I guess. Um, I uh, get my main, my main source of income is uh, by patreon.com. I don't say this to ask you of money, it would be appreciated, of course, but I do get now enough income to be able to not have to worry about always doing consulting work to, to, uh, to get an income. I do uh, sort of get um, funded by, by all these donations uh, some of them give $1 a month or 1 euro, or some give slightly bigger amounts. 
And that allows me to work basically on what I do is criticizing other people's papers, or as some might call it, post-publication peer review. So I look at scientific papers and I criticize them. I find errors in them, and most of them are images, and I'll show you lots of examples in the next couple of slides. Um, but sometimes I also find other problems like plagiarism or animal ethics, like very big tumors, or uh, human ethics, so no approval of, of doing human research. All kinds of problems that apparently have been missed by peer reviewers and, uh, and editors alike. Because as we know, sometimes peer review is just not a very good process. And we hope, of course, that all papers are thoroughly reviewed before they get published, but that's not always the case. Um, there's also many other people who, who do the work that I do. So uh, a lot of people do um, give some of their time to look at papers and find errors in them. So some, some of the people that I've listed here at the bottom of my slides, many of them are on Twitter, they work on plagiarism or statistical errors or um, no, all kinds of problems. Most of them work on images, uh, but they might also provide the platforms that we can use to post these problems on. Because basically we, we see it as our task to if we see something, say something. If we see a problem in a scientific paper, we want to warn others um, that there might be a problem. And so I'll, I'll talk later about how and where we post these problems. And you can use that to, to look at a paper to see if there's any potential problem that have been, has been uh, found by others. So I want to give credit to all these people here and many more. Um, many of them work under pseudonyms. You can imagine that the work we do, criticizing other people's papers, is not always um, you know, taken in, uh, in, with gratitude. And so some of us work under pseudonyms. I do most of my postings nowadays under my full name, although I have worked under a pseudonym in the past. So with that out of the way, <laughs> why do we care about science misconduct? For me, science is about finding the truth. For me, that's the core of science. As a scientist, we should be interested in finding how a particular pathway works, how a particular chemical process works. It is all about the truth. While science misconduct or, or just errors in science are a deviation from the truth. And so it's important because science builds upon science. Every science paper is the result of the work of previous generation of scientists. We as scientists are not just working by ourselves, we're standing upon the shoulders of giants. We work on other people's work, we build upon that. So I see publications as building blocks, as bricks in a wall, the wall of science as you can call it. And if some of these bricks, some of these publications are, uh, do contain an error or contain even falsified or fabricated results. That means that other papers or other people who built their research upon those papers might actually waste a lot of time trying to replicate those results. And we probably all have heard of the replication crisis, which I don't think is as severe as, as it sounds. But yes, if we as scientists cannot replicate other people's work, we might waste two, three, or 10 years of research money and time trying to replicate those results. So as a scientist, we should worry about errors and about fraud in science because that is just not helping science to progress. And um, I, I started as a scientist at, at sort of assuming that all scientists were super honest, that all of us were, were just in there to to find the truth. And I was actually shocked when I found that somebody had stolen my sentences and plagiarized my, my work. And uh, not just my work, but, but uh, a lot of other scientists as well. And so I was shocked to find fraud in science. But science as a field, unfortunately, is not immune to fraud. There is fraud in science, like in any other field you can think of, banking or construction or whatever. There is fraud in science. So I'm, I'm going to tell about that, but I don't want you to leave this room thinking that all science is fraudulent. That could be, of course, the, 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 the pitfall of listening to my talk. I do believe in science, and I'll, say, I'll repeat this at the end, because I think it's an important message. Science um, 
uh, yeah, science should be about finding the truth, and we need science for to solve a lot of problems. But uh, there is fraud in science, and I want you to sort of implant that seed that not all papers that you might find contain the complete truth. And, and so I'll, I'll talk about science misconduct and show you some examples of what I think is science misconduct. But I uh, want to first also def uh, define or give the definition of science misconduct, at least in the US. Uh, science misconduct is defined as one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, and fabrication, in which plagiarism, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, stealing other people's text or ideas without giving credit. Falsification is where a person does an experiment, but sort of tweaks the results a little bit, like leaves out an outlier or, or increases a value so it crosses a certain threshold and becomes from a positive a negative or a negative a positive. Where fabrication is where a person completely makes up results, so not even do, does an experiment. So those are the definition of science misconduct. There's all kinds of questionable research practices, p-hacking, uh, animal ethics stuff, which is not, uh, does not really fall under science misconduct, but are definitely worth noting and, and uh, yeah, knowing about that it happens in a paper. So also when I work on science misconduct, I try to think of the reasons why a person might do misconduct. So there's a couple of reasons I, I have sort of come up with. And of course, the main reason why a person would do science misconduct is the pressure to publish. Science has become almost an industry where, as a scientist, we need to publish and we need to have an X number of publication to um, finish our PhD or to become a professor or run our research group or get grants. There's so much pressure to publish, but science doesn't always work that way. If we put too much pressure on a scientist to publish, they might be tempted to make up results, or they might be tempted to yeah, change the results a little bit to, to make it look better, or to not publish negative results. So that's sort of a general scenario, but there's two other scenarios I've come across. So one is the what I call the taste of success, the very successful, uh, maybe PhD student or postdoc who had a, a brilliant paper, who got published in Science or Nature and, and won all these awards, maybe was on national television, and they have tasted success and it tastes good and they really want to do that again. And now they become a professor somewhere, their research topic is slightly different and it's not going so well. The results are not that great, but they have all these people who say you're, you're fantastic and you've won all these awards and I think this is a sort of a petri dish to, to generate a person to, to falsify results. And another scenario is even more common. That's the power play. Academia has so much uh, hierarchy and it's as a, uh, a junior person, you're really in a position where you're dependent on your professor to get a good grade or to get your letter of recommendation. And if your research doesn't go as well, you might work for a professor who's a bully and who sort of demands that certain results are delivered to, to him or to her. And if you have a professor who's a bully, who has this very powerful position, as a graduate student, you sort of want to please them. And if you think of the situation where a person maybe works on a visa, and this is, for example, in the US, if you are uh, from a non-US country and you come to work in the US and do your PhD or your postdoc, and you're on a visa, if you get fired by a professor, you need your, your visa immediately expires and you need to go back to your home country within five days or so. And that is a huge amount of pressure to put on a person. And you can imagine that a person in that situation, a junior person, might be very tempted to deliver this beautiful PCR result or this beautiful uh, other analysis to the professor and to uh, just to keep their job or to keep their family in the US or wherever country they, they are working in. There's so much pressure to publish that these scenarios I think are, are fairly common. And um, it also makes me respectful for the people who do misconduct. So when I show examples, I usually don't make it about the persons because there is a sad story behind each of these cases. And I wanna be respectful for that. I do post a lot of images on Twitter, but I try not to make it, I usually don't give the, the uh, identity of the paper. I mean, if you're a good searcher, you can probably figure it out. 
But I, I don't want to criticize people. I want to criticize the papers and the errors, but I'm not going to make it about the, the, the people who are doing it because it's, it's not always clear who is responsible. Is it the junior person who felt the pressure or is it the, 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 the big boss of the lab who did not Photoshop themselves or didn't fabricate themselves but created this atmosphere in the lab that, that created the, 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 the misconduct? So with that in mind, there have been several important cases of misconduct that you might have heard of. I, didn't, I wasn't involved in any of these, but they're, they have been in the news. And, and I just put some examples here that you might have heard of, uh, sort of showing that, image, uh, that science misconduct happens in all kinds of fields across science and sometimes ha can have huge uh, repercussions. In particular, I think that the Andrew Wakefield paper in The Lancet that got retracted so in that paper, he claimed that the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, caused or was correlated at least with autism in young children. It's a sort of a, well, it was published in the Lancet, but it's only 12 children. But it turned out that he falsified some of the results. For example, some of the children already had autism-like symptoms before they received the vaccine. And uh, yeah, so he changed some dates and he changed some pathology results. And it took 12 years of whistleblowers and people who knew more about the background uh, to, to figure out what really had happened. Uh, and it took 12 years to get that paper retracted. But I think this paper is the sort of the foundation of the distrust that some people have in, in science. And they, it had a huge amount of, a uh, huge, huge effect because I think a lot of people took this for granted. The, the, the 12 years were just too long to get this paper retracted and it already had infiltrated what people think that uh, the correlation is between um, autism and vaccines, even though there have been many other papers published since then that say that there is no correlation at all. And these were not based on 12 children, but on tens of thousands of children. So this paper still has a huge amount of influence. And I think it's the prime example of what misconduct can do, the harm it can do to what the general audience thinks um, is the truth, but this was not the truth. So the other cases are more like in physics, in medicine. Uh, of course, if you're from the Netherlands, you are very familiar perhaps with the case of Diederik Stapel, a person who fabricated lots of his research papers and is, uh, was, um, uh, so the, the whistleblowers were people working in, uh, in his lab, and he's up to 58 retractions. So 58 of his studies, I'm not quite sure what the percentages of, of his, all his papers were completely made up. He just made up results. And I think this is sort of an example of the taste of success, because uh, this was a very famous person who was interviewed a lot on, on television. So my first finding of what I think is misconduct, and I'm, I'm of course not 100% sure, is this particular one. So I was looking um, at a PhD thesis, and it had plagiarism, but it also had a couple of images. These are Western blots, if you're not familiar, just focus on the parts that I um, circled or sort of boxed with blue uh, uh, cyan boxes. So there were three figures in, these, in this PhD thesis, they ha also had been published in papers, uh, that showed the same blot. And you, uh, I'm not sure if this works, let's see. Yeah, so there's this little dot here that you might recognize in all three. But if you look at the, the, the labels, they're all different. And I actually had to flip one of the images to, uh, to make it match the others. So it appears that the author of this paper had used the same blot three times to represent three different experiments. And in one case, even, even mirrored or rotated the image um, to, to make it look different. And so it seems that a rotation like that or a mirroring is not done by accident. And so it seems that this was done intentionally. Now it's not up to me to tell if to tell an editor if this was misconduct or not, but I reported this to the editor and the papers got retracted. So I assume the editor agreed that this looked like it was done intentionally. So this is my first example. And I realize I guess I have some talent to spot these things because these were peer reviewed papers and nobody had seen them. So why did I see them and they got retracted? So maybe I should use this talent 
for some, you know, for to scan some more papers. So I started scanning other papers. But I also realized it's very hard to recognize photoshopping. But it's easy for the, or easier for the human brain to recognize duplications. So I'm, I'm showing here some examples that you might be familiar with. These are obviously not from science papers, but they're just general examples of how photos can be altered, changed to mislead. To, uh, so, so photos are such a powerful thing. We as humans are very visual and we have these expressions like seeing is believing. If we see a photo, we tend to believe it. We might even say a photo or it didn't happen. But a photo nowadays is so easy to alter, so easy to manipulate, that we cannot really distinguish between a Photoshop paper, a Photoshopped image, or a Photoshopped uh, with artificial intelligence. We can make people say whatever we want them to say. So no longer can we trust images. And so here are some examples of images that have been altered. You might be familiar with some of them. I think the most recent one was this one. This was actually made for fun, but it's a photo of a Trump rally. Uh, and there's like, the audience has been photoshopped. This was actually not really done to uh, discredit Trump, but more as a fun thing. But these things are put out of context and then they, they're put on Twitter. And, and so you can try to discredit somebody um, by making photos. You can make presidents read a book upside down. Uh, that, that never happened, that's photoshopped. Or you can put two people together who actually have never met each other. And so these, these types of photos are really photoshopped to bring a false message that President Biden has met Jeffrey Epstein and we're smiling together. But these are, this is a composite, it's not a real photo. So um, there's also photos in which handicapped people are, are sh uh, photoshopped in a stock photo to make it look like it's a really a diverse photo. Um, but what my point here is that it's hard to recognize that these are Photoshop things by just looking at them. You need to do reverse image searches and see if it, that is a real photo or not. But we can see with our eyes, or at least I can see, and I think about half of the audience I would estimate, can see duplications. And so this is a hovercraft landing in North Korea, and it makes, like there's, there's hovercrafts duplicated to make it look like there was a, a much bigger invasion of this beach. Or uh, this is a, a missile launch in Iran, where this middle one actually didn't go off. And so they photoshopped some of the clouds and the missiles from the other uh, three uh, with, that did go off to make it look like all, that all missiles went off. Because if you look at the original photo, one of them did not go off and was still stuck in the, in the, missile, in the launcher. And so we can, photos can be misused, but we can not easily recognize that, but we can recognize duplications. So that's what I do. And so if you think about photos in scientific papers, they might look like some of these examples. So a figure in a scientific paper might be a line graph or they might be a photo. Now still, I think it's much easier to, to fabricate a line graph than a photo. So it's very easy. I mean, I made these two figures. They're from my own paper, so I know this is real data. Um, but like, it, you could also type in some numbers in Excel and make up a beautiful graph and it would look real. But a photo is a little bit harder to do because we still have our eyes and we can look at photos and see that they're real. And all these photos are fine. There's no duplications here. They all look fine to me. But there's also examples where there is a duplication. And can I see a raise of hand if somebody spots a duplication in this photo? Just raise your hand. Very well done. I think most people see this. There's, there's two duplications actually in this photo. And so this is what I call a simple duplication. It's the exact same photo being used to represent two different experiments. Now all of you, almost all of you could see this. Still this was, it went through peer review. The peer reviewer didn't see this. And so I wrote to the journal in October 2015, but the journal never took any action. Now I don't think this is misconduct. I don't think this is a very serious error. But still, it's, it's yeah, something that should have not passed with peer review. Somebody should have caught this. So these simple duplication, where the exact same photo is used twice, are often uh, just honest errors. They're not misconduct, although it's not up to me to decide that. But there's also cases where there's a duplication with an overlap. So here we're looking at 
what obviously are four different photos, but two of them are overlapping. I'm not sure what happened there. But uh, can anybody spot an overlap here? It's a little bit harder when there's a, not a direct duplication. These become quickly very complicated, but there's actually an overlap between two of these panels representing two different experiments. And so these types of overlaps, I, uh, I can scan, I scan most of these by eye, um, and sometimes it takes me a while to look at these things. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is honest error or not, but it's a little bit more likely when you move the sample under the microscope a little bit and grab a different cell that this was done intentionally, uh, with the intention to mislead, but I'm not sure. Again, I reported this to the journal in October 2015, and it was not addressed at all. There's no correction, there's no retraction. I think correction might be the co a good outcome, but nothing happened. The journal didn't really uh, respond. Uh, and it was cited 59 times. So 59 other researchers based their research on this photo, perhaps. Now, this is another example of a type 2 duplication. And again, this might be hard to spot. There's lots of blots here, lots of photos here, lots of panels. Uh, they're all different experiments, but there's lots of overlaps. So if you look a little bit longer, you might spot lots of overlaps. This is to the point where I think this was definitely done intentionally because if you are a researcher and you make so many mistakes labeling your photos, you should, you should know which photo belonged to which experiment. But if they all overlap with each other, they're, they're definitely not, um, yeah, that's, that's not good signs. So this paper I uh, only reported online, but again, there was no action. So it was only cited nine times. So that's the damage hopefully is, is not too bad. Um, then we have type three duplications. So those are duplications that have duplicated elements or like an alteration of the photo, or you might just call it photoshopping. So these are type three. This was published in a paper claiming that this was a patient before a laser treatment to remove his brown spots in his face and after a laser treatment, six months later. But somebody noted that this is actually the same photo. The guy is wearing the same shirt. He, all his hairs, all the fine lines in his face are exactly the same. Um, the photo is cropped differently, and that makes it look differently. And also the little bar on his eyes is different. But if you look carefully, and if you can do 3D vision, you can actually spot that this is the same photo. It's just the, re the, just the, the brown spots were removed, not by laser, but by digital treatment. And so this, this paper took a lot of fight, but we got it retracted. So this paper is retracted. The authors kept on claiming, oh, the guy was just wearing the same shirt six months later. We were like, mm -mm, that's the same photo. But it, take, it took a lot of <laughs> convincing the editor that this was, because a lot of editors don't believe a random woman who just claims that, this, that she has magical eyes and she can see this. Um, a lot of editors can only be convinced if there's a software tool um, confirming what I already see with my eyes. But I think our eyes are pretty good in detecting these things. So some other examples of duplications, uh, type three duplication. So, um, does somebody spot a duplication in this photo? Can I see a raise of hands? I think the front row has an advantage here, maybe. But I do see some people in the back. So well done. There's a couple of duplications here. Um, so these are fungal spores. And I don't know, I guess they, they copied, they cloned that photo, uh, the, the, the spore, a couple of times to make it look like there's more spores in the photo. But for me, this, this is the same as looking at a photo of a dinner party and seeing Uncle Larry twice in the same photo. Uh, it's, it doesn't really look very convincing to me unless Uncle Larry has a, has a you know, twin brother. Maybe there is a, you know, he can be visible twice in the same photo. But yeah, it, it, it's the equivalent of, of looking at these photos. And, and so I wrote to the editor and in my opinion, if a scientist does this, they're out. Like you, you sh just should not Photoshop extra cells and make it look better. Like, uh, but, but in this case, the editor accepted a new version of the figure in which they just showed all the cells or the, all the fungal uh, spores only once. So the, they really showed the original figure and they accepted it and issued a correction. And for me, this is the same as a winner of the Tour de France who after, just after the race gives his urine sample or her urine sample to the doctor. They do a doping test and he's positive. 
Like, would you allow the winner of the Tour de France to give another urine sample three weeks later that is clean? No, I mean, they're positive, they're out. Like, like I don't know, I, I feel corrections of these photoshopped images is just completely wrong. And But it's hard to convince editors because editors don't always want to have the courage to, to retract these things. But they should, according to the, the Commission on Publication Ethic guidelines. So here's, a, here's one from a very well-known person. So usually I don't make it about the persons, but I'll give a hint. This is a person in the, in the Netherlands who was the, uh, the head of the Hubrecht laboratory and later became uh, a minister. And uh, you, you might have known the name. And so uh, he's the senior author of this paper. But this was published in Science, and I spotted a duplication in part of the image. This is not a simple duplication. Part of the image has been cloned into either from one panel to another. I'm not quite sure what the original is. Well, the, probably the right one is the, the photoshopped one. And so this is, this is a severe case of photoshopping. But science didn't want to retract this. So, I mean, I, I called this out on Twitter. I talked to the uh, editor-in-chief uh, of science. And finally, this paper got retracted. But they actually said uh, that they never got my email, or, or they lost it, or so. Nobody had ever really done anything. And it took, you know, for me to sort of build up my reputation as a person who actually sees these things, and uh, to get to convince science to retract this paper. I think that's a good outcome. And I really, really hope that some journalists will write about this, because this is a very public figure. And, and the, the, the first author of this paper just got a position um, at uh, the Forensic Institute in the Netherlands. Like, like, these are people of power, and I'm not quite sure, obviously, who did the photoshopping, but I don't think this is how you should do science, and I think this should have consequences for your career if you do this. But it seems that these people can happily keep on frauding and not have any uh, consequences. Well, I'm usually the one who... Uh, gets blamed for, uh, I don't know, rocking the boat too much or so. So I did do a science paper on these types of duplications. So I looked at punch, a bunch of science papers. Um, I scanned 20,000 papers by eye. I did this in 2014 and 15. Um, and I found around 800 papers in this set. And this was heavily focused towards molecular biology papers uh, because those have those types of figures that I just showed you. So 4% of these papers have duplicated figures. Now, these are category one, two, or three, so not all of them are intentional, but we estimated about half of these uh, 400 papers, half of these 800 papers, so 400 papers, had intentionally duplicated images. So that would be 2% of all science papers. I don't know if we can really extrapolate that, but if you, if you think that 2% of all science papers might have Misconduct, that's already quite a lot. It's, uh, you know, one in 50. But I also think it's much easier to fabricate or falsify results that is not in a photo. Like, remember that bar graph? I mean, you could just easily type in some numbers, basically what Tiedrich Stapel has done, type in some numbers, publish a beautiful graph or table, um, and, and people might think that that is true. So alteration in other types of data that is not a photo is even much harder to detect. And of course, I cannot detect a really good Photoshopper. If you are maybe a smart person, and most scientists are smart persons, you might be very good in Photoshopping as well, or, or changing your results in any other way. So I think the real percentage of misconduct is much higher, much higher than 2%. It might be in the 5 to even 10% range. And I think that's a very scary number. If 10% of papers contains fabricated data, then yeah, we have to be super careful. It's very likely that you'll come across a paper that contains data like that, that it's not reliable. Unfortunately, the journals are very slow to respond. I've shown you already some results that, that looked like they were photoshopped and it just took a hard, me a, a lot of effort to try to get these papers at least corrected or even retracted. But unfortunately, so of this initial data set of 800 papers that are reported around 2015, um, two thirds had not been taken action upon after waiting five years. I gave the editors a long time to respond. 
27% uh, were corrected and 7% were retracted. And there's a tiny sliver of expression of concern. So two thirds of the papers that had, have these obvious problems are not responded to, not even corrected. And I think this is, this is even worse than misconduct. It's the inability of scientific publishers to respond to these things in a swift way. Like they could immediately slap on an expression of concern pending investigations, showing readers that there's a potential big problem. I mean, may, most of these things I can spot in two minutes or two seconds sometimes. Why does it take five years or even longer to respond to these things? There's a really very, uh, yeah, I think this is, this is just a super big problem that, um, that science is not as self-correcting as we would like it to be. And the problem appears to be with the scientific publisher who just have no good um, infrastructure to respond to these uh, allegations. And of course, also institutions appear to sweep these things under the rug. I have some examples here. I mean, there was a New York Times article about a person who did, who is implicated in a lot of papers with image problems, and he's still employed as a professor. He actually sued, tried to sue the New York Times uh, for this headline, um, but he, he lost that case. I've worked on a case, uh, one of the biggest uh, scientists in China, who, uh, where I found 55 papers with problems, and one of them looked, look, I don't know if you can see it, but there's lots of problems in this flow cytometry image, lots of cloned parts. But the, the, the Chinese government decided that no misconduct was done. I mean, I cannot find the Chinese uh, government myself, but like, it seems to me that there's a big problem in this lab, but there was no fraud or plagiarism found. By That's at least the declaration of the government. And then, of course, in Leiden, there is um, you know, a, a case where um, there was a misconduct found, but the report that came out initially was completely blacked out. It said these and these papers need to be retracted, but all the papers had been you know, it's like a report of the Secret Service. It's like, what is the use for the scientific community in these things? Like, these reports do not serve the scientific community. We need more people to be angry about these things, and we need more openness, because science cannot be served by, you know, yeah, we found a problem, but we're not going to tell you what it was. Like, that is just not serving the, the community. So there's a lot of sweeping under the carpet, by uh, institutions, unfortunately. So the way I now report these things is I report them online. So by now I've found around 6,000 papers with problems. And yes, I've, I'll still report them to the journals and to the editors and to the, the, the institutions, but I know how frustrating it is and I want to actually make people aware that there's a big problem. So I post them on pubpeer.com and I encourage you if you do scientific literature searches, um, to install, they have a little plugin that you can install that will work with your browser. And so, um, Papier is run also by volunteers like me. Um, you can post there completely anonymously, they don't even register your IP address, but you can also just use it to search for papers, because if a paper has a Papier comment, you, if you do a literature search, for example, and the DOI is somewhere in the on the, the web page, it will show these, these greenish banners and you can click on it and then see uh, the comment that a person left on a paper. And so you can also search for researchers' names. Well, but some, some people, like all my papers have, I think by, by now have been uh, scrutinized by other people because of course a lot of people want to take revenge of what I do. So it's not always you know, completely fair, but you can just go there and see what other people had to say. You can also leave Positive comments, of course. So it's the, but yeah, most of them are about images and image problems because they're so obvious for 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 us to pick up on. So I'm posting. I've now uh, yeah more than five thousand posts on Papier, but there's many other very active users. Some generate a new username every name. I post under my full name, so you can also look up for users, and and see who posted what. So some other people have like I think up to ten thousand or so posts. So there's hundreds of thousands of papers, I think, by now on Papier that have been flagged. And we feel that this is the best we can currently do, the best tool to warn the scientific community or everybody else 
that there might be a potential big problem with the, with the paper, because if we try to wait for the, the editors, the publishers, or the institutions to solve these issues, we can wait a long time, and in the meantime, damage can be done. So, a question I you, uh, very often get is, well, you're using your eyes, but computer can do much better, of course. Yes, that might be true, but it is actually a very tricky problem to find these duplications. But, of course, technology is uh, improving, and so there are now a couple of uh, tools on the market that can help people like me and editors to screen manuscripts or papers for these types of duplications. And, uh, but it was a very hard computational problem, apparently, to solve. I actually participated in a, in a DARPA challenge in the US, uh, Media Media MIDI 4, uh, in which uh, several groups, computational uh, yeah, groups, were, were trying to, to look at images and seeing duplications. And it was very hard to just extract images from PDFs or to, to ignore labels, because we humans have no problem with that, but the computers apparently had a harder time. But now we have a couple of tools. So I'm actually using Image Twin, and these, some of these tools are being used by uh, or being tested now by scientific publishers. And of course, eventually they will be better than humans. We still need human assignment to, uh, to look at these images and uh, because they sometimes uh, call out false positive or they miss certain things, but they're helpful because, um, for example, Image Twin now has a, has a library of some images that were published in PMC, which is PubMed Central, open access papers. And so it has a library and it can check a manuscript or PDF against that library, and it will sometimes find uh, overlaps with other papers. And that is something, as humans, we have trouble remembering, of course, thousands of images, but this is where the software tools can really help us. And eventually, I think a couple years down the road, we will have software to scan every image against databases of other images, and that, then it becomes very similar to a plagiarism checker, of course. Um, but of, unfortunately, AI, artificial intelligence, can also generate fake photos. And I think this is where I'm really, really worried about. So you are probably familiar, or you should be familiar with thispersondoesn'texist.com. It will generate, every time you click, it will generate a new face. And that face looks pretty believable. I think most of us would be fooled by these photos. But these, these photos are generated from a library of you know, other faces. And uh, you can sometimes see some, some, some artifacts in the background or so, or like two different earrings. But I think this is getting really good. And, you know, we can, we can have fun with these AI, like Delhi, what is it, Delhi Mini or so, I think now it's very popular. We can generate photos that look very realistic, but are completely fake. And, you know, my, my talent as duplication spotter would be completely useless here. I would not... Uh, I would not recognize this. So if we can make human faces look real and think about how our brains are completely, uh, you know, a large part of our brain is in facial recognitions. If the nose is slightly at a different position, we would already know that this face is not real. But we, we would think this is pretty real. But like, how easy is it to generate a fake image that looks like a Western blot? And we already found these. We have found hundreds and hundreds of papers, and this is teamwork, I'm far from alone, I was not the first person working on this. I often get credit for the Tadpole paper mill, but it's just because I made up the name. But, um, so there's lots of people working on this. So there's a set of about six, maybe thousands papers that all used the same background. So it's, it's hard. these are from two different papers. All the panels have the same background, not across these two papers, but across 600 papers, but the, the blots themselves, the bands, the protein bands, look pretty unique, but they sort of have a weird shape. And if you're very familiar with Western blots, you recognize that these look too, too regular. Um, but yeah, the, the, the people who made this made the mistake of using the same background. So this is how we recognize it. We believe these are generated with the same technology as these human faces. So it's GAN technology. And so this is... Um, example of, of a paper mill, and paper mills are companies that, that uh, generate lots of fake papers, completely fake papers with believable images, either generated through AI 
or generated um, just using stealing somebody else's photos, maybe from other papers or from somebody's microscope uh, left, you know, left there unattended, and using these photos to represent different experiments. So very often you find overlaps across papers. We believe these papers are completely fake. Uh, we have found paper mills from China, Russia, and Iran, but there's probably many others. The one that I just showed you is from China, and that is not because people in these countries are more fraudulent than in other countries. It's because they have a very high pressure to publish. China, for example, has a rule that when you want to become a medical doctor, and you're not a researcher, but you still have to publish a scientific paper in order to get a position at uh, a clinical hospital. So this is sort of a, a ridiculous rule because these people are doctors, they're not scientists, but they have to publish a scientific paper. Now, if you just suddenly have to publish a scientific paper, it's much easier to buy one than to actually generate one. So these people buy uh, for a big price, they buy an authorship because eventually this is an investment in their career. They don't really care about science. So uh, lots of people have to give credit who has, have worked on these, uh, on these paper mills but this is a huge problem because they are getting better. Of course, we, we busted them with the, back, the background that they used, but there's, they're getting so good that we probably cannot recognize these, these fake papers anymore. And then finally, we have, of course, had a pandemic. And in the pandemic, as you all know, there was just a, uh, a fire hose of papers that got published. Like It seemed that everybody wanted to write a paper about COVID. So there were many, many, many papers published around COVID, like the, the numbers of preprint and, and editorials went up and went through the roof. All these papers appear to have been very hastily written and peer reviewed or not peer reviewed at all. And of course we were in a pandemic and we had this need of knowledge. Do vaccines work? Do masks work? Do, you know, is it, is the virus transmitted through aerosols or not? And so, Science is not really doesn't did not have the answers at that point. Like and as any scientific process, scientists were looking for answers, and sometimes these answers were were not the complete picture. But if they were because they were published so hastily, it seemed for the general audience that you know sometimes mask worked or not. Like the, it seemed that the advice was very um, uh, wishy washy. Like was flip flopping from one opinion to another, but science is a process. And some people say it's like looking at a big picture, a painting maybe of like a sea and a beach and then a forest. If you just look at one part, you might see a forest. If you just look at another part of the image, you might see uh, only the sea, but it is part of a bigger picture. And so if you try to publish something very quickly and hastily, you might only see one part of the image and not realize that the reality is very complex, like anything in, in biology or science. And so it, it, there was also, of course, a lot of uh, misinformation. And I have worked myself on a paper that was um, published by an institute in Marseille in France, uh, which claimed that hydroxychloroquine could uh, be used to treat people and to cure them from COVID. This paper was only based on 40 patients. And the results seemed a bit weird because a couple of people had died or turned, uh, didn't really do very well, were admitted to the ICU after using hydroxychloroquine, but they were left out of the study. And you know, your results look really better if you leave out the people who died, but you cannot really do that in science. But this paper got published. One of the authors was the editor in chief of the journal and it was published within peer reviewed within 24 hours. So it seemed very, uh, you know, not a very good paper. I wrote a big criticism on this paper and um, the, the author of that paper, whose photo you might see on this picture, um, actually uh, called me like a girl and like a headhunter and he didn't really have a, good of, a lot of good words for me and I understand that. But he also made some YouTube videos about me which had millions of views. He made, um, he, and he threatened to sue me. So he filed a complaint with the procureur in, in Marseille and uh, he claimed that I uh, tried to harass him. And, uh, but in reality, it seemed to be the other way around because I, re I was doxxed, like my home address was published online by his group. Um, and he consistently calls me Mrs. Big and a blogger and like people tried to ruin my, my uh, Wikipedia page. So there was just a whole campaign against me. And those are hard things. And 
I know this is the, the price I have to pay for criticizing people, but I'm not going to stop. So I was one of the very few persons who actually said, well, you know, just sue me then, okay. But it luckily didn't happen. And I actually received a lot of support from the scientific community. There were lots of petitions who supported me saying, like, science, science criticism is good. Like, we should not fight these things in court. You should not, you know, immediately sue the person who's criticizing you. Like, try first to disprove, you know, prove that I'm, I'm wrong. I would love to be proven wrong, but, yeah. He, uh, the lawsuit didn't happen, as far as I know. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. But, yeah, there was just a lot of misinformation. And um, uh, there was also the surgery here paper that, that's, that uh, said that uh, hydroxychloroquine was uh, not working at all, but that was turned out to be fake, and that got retracted. And so I think for a general audience, it's just very hard to know, like, what should we believe? Because there was a paper claiming hydroxychloroquine did not work. That got retracted. But the paper, the tiny paper that said that hydroxychloroquine did work, that was tweeted by President Trump, and that was, you know, not retracted at all. So we should believe that. Well, I think it's actually the other way around, because there were later many papers that also proved that, um, that hydroxychloroquine did not work. Anyway, there was a lot of confusion and not sure how to solve this because I, I do think in a, in a situation of a pandemic, there is, there is a panic situation. We, you know, when you, you don't make the best decisions, when you're in a house on fire, you just drum, jump out of the window and looking back, maybe, you know, you could have found another escape route. But so in a situation like a pandemic, everybody wanted answers, but I think there was just too many papers published and just no critical review of these papers at all. So um, I talked about legal threats already. So with that, this is my last slide. So these are some points to remember and to think about. So again, seeing is believing. We tend to look at figures or images or photos and believe them, but it's always good to ask critical questions and I'm not sure how to deal with this you know, new technology that will enable us to make photos that look very realistic. I think as, as journalists and scientists, we need to think about these things. How can we now believe that photos are real? Like we need to have better software tools knowing, you know, showing that a photo is the original. And I'm not quite sure how to solve this, but I hope that people are thinking about this. And because this is going to be the, the, the next struggle, we can make people say anything in videos or in photos, and, and it's just very easy to spread misinformation. So I do think also that as scientists, we focus way too, too much on scientific papers as a measure of a scientist's productivity. There's many other ways we can do that. And if we put too much pressure on science, then we will generate more misconduct. There's also lots of conflict of interest. The publishers do not wanna retract these things. The institutions don't think there's a problem at all. There's just too much being swept under the rug and too, too few people who stand up uh, against that and who will say, this is not good. We cannot just let this go. We need to be much more critical because science is about finding the truth. Anybody who deviates from that should not be called a scientist and should, there should be repercussions for their career. Um, whose role is it to detect science misconduct? Is it like, you know, patron funded volunteers like me? Or should this be more towards the end of the scientific publishers, which I believe that should be the case because they, we pay them a lot of money to get our papers published. But part of that money should go into quality control and also recall actions. If, you know, if my car breaks down a week after I bought it, I expect the, the garage to fix that or the dealer. Like I, you, know, you expect as a consumer to have some some label of warranty and to be helped if there's a problem with the product. But that doesn't seem to be the case in scientific publishing. Uh, then I hope there will be a better legal protection. Like I'm an unaffiliated person. So if, if this person from Marseille tries to sue me, I might be financially ruined. This could really ruin my, me and I could lose everything I have. Um, but I'm willing to take that risk because I feel somebody has to do it. And I, I, I think this, this, you know, maybe let him sue me and let's see what happens. But 
there, there should be much more legal protection for whistleblowers, not just like me, but also per persons working within a, a lab and who, who uh, uh, say that there's misconduct in that lab. Because very often the junior researcher will have to go and the senior researcher can keep on frauding. Um, so science and politics, talked a little bit about that, are, appear to be no longer separated. And then finally, I'm going to mention this again. There's a tremendous cost of a misconduct, not just for scientists who might not be able to replicate other papers' results, but for science as a general. As, because all these retractions, all these discussions about which papers to trust or which papers to not trust have done in the past two years, but also in general, a lot of damage to science. Uh, I do hope you don't walk away being completely disillusioned that all science is misconduct. That's definitely not the case. Um, and there's people like me, but many others as well, who are, are fighting for this with our limited needs uh, and means. Um, but we also, I, I would be very, very grateful if there was more talk about this in an article, if there was more investigations into these cases that are continuously swept under the rug. I hope there's people who have the time and the courage to write about this, even if they might face legal consequences. So with that, thank you so much. And you can follow me on, uh, on Twitter. I play the game Image Forensics, and you can win uh, an emoji award if you're the first person uh, posting it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So who will be going to write uh, about Elizabeth's work? Some people already have written about my work, so very That's grateful for that. Good. Um, we um, have time for one or two questions because, yes, and you're the first holding up your hand. Very brave. <laughs> I'm walking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the brilliant talk and for your work. And to add up to that slide, um, you. Don't get me wrong, my comment is not against you and definitely not against like fighting for scientific integrity. But as a matter of fact now, as this job is done by volunteers, is it safe enough? Because the amount of papers is huge. So there is a natural selection bias. We normally think, okay, volunteers are volunteers. They're not affiliated, they're not for profit. And then you say, okay, some people are um, anonymous for their safety. But if I'm anonymous and I'm just simply paid by the competitor of that professor doctor, mm -hmm. uh, or am I paid by Russian government? Mm -hmm. Because Russian government wants to destroy the public image of uh, Western science and say they're all fraud. Mm -hmm. That's, have, have, you, have you seen that cases when uh, some you know, search was deliberately done against some person and what in general do you think um, how, how this should be treated and to whom should it be given? Thank you. Sure, yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, Pop here where we post our results is heavily moderated. So you cannot, I mean, some things fly under the radar, but uh, if you're a new user and you're like, you haven't earned the trust of the, of the Pop here moderators, uh, your command might not be approved. And so you cannot just say, I mean, I've had many attacks on my papers, like, oh, all Elizabeth's big papers are completely fraudulent because she worked for Ubiome and Ubiome was a fraud. That is not a good argument for that particular paper. And so uh, the moderators will try to catch those comments. Um, sometimes there is revenge, indeed, but if there's really a problem, then th that will be allowed. So it is moderated. I think that's a lot of people are worried about that, but yeah. We have time for one more question in the back. Um, hello, Christy Beutcher from Germany. A short question. Um, do you, like when you do your hunting work, um, I, ge I guess you have some other clues uh, or intuition where in which papers you might find something. Is, 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 um, can, you, can you maybe explain this, um, what the signs are that there, must, there could be something shady going on? Yeah, so I get a lot of tips. So people send me uh, emails or on Twitter, or direct messages. Um, I'm also still working off the 20,000 papers that I scanned initially. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So I still have all the papers that I found. I still want to scan other papers by these researchers. So uh, very often, if a person frauds once, they will fraud twice. But I do mainly work off of tips. Um, I don't really usually respond to just check out the work of my competitor type of tips. But um, yeah, if they say this paper, I think there's a duplication, I will look at that. And if I agree, I will post it on Papier and sometimes screen more papers. So ideally, you would have like <coughs> 100 Sorry. people, uh, an organization of 100 people doing the same work as you, or not? Um, well, I don't want to lead an organization <laughs> like that, if that's what you're implying. Yeah, I think okay. most of us work alone. We do have a Slack group in which we try to communicate. So there's about 20 people, I think, who do this type of work. I'm by far the most visible person, so I talk on behalf of all of them, but most are anonymously. Okay. Thank you so much for answering these two questions. I bet you all have questions for Elizabeth. I hope you will stay uh, today. Elizabeth, will you walk around during the breaks? I will. Great. Well, then you uh, can expect lots of questions from all of us, I uh, think. So thank you once again and with a big applause.